All right, I've got some rapid fire gear recommendations for you today. Field proven stuff. You're going to love this quick review. You could put a hashtag on this. It would be hashtag shit that works. So this is stuff that really works. I get kind of excited about finding really amazing gear. And I'm going to start with a shirt, which you're going to think is hilarious. Why would you be talking about a shirt? Well, it's really about the fiber in the shirt. This just miraculous fiber is, it, it makes a huge difference. It's made out of organic cotton and bamboo, a bamboo fiber, which I think is called maybe a bamboo derived rayon type of fiber. Uh, and it's got, I think, 5% lycra in it to have some stretchability. The shirt is made by a company called Task, T-A-S-C. And we don't represent them. We don't even sell their gear. You'd have to find it somewhere else. But this is amazing. I just recently did a weekend uh, training with some combat medics. And we, we spent a lot of the weekend in the hot Texas, very humid weather in a forest dragging mannequins through the forest and uh, stuffing gauze into simulated bullet wounds and things like that, slapping tourniquets on people, all while shooting our carbines and pistols and reloading with one hand while you're wounded and things like that. And for this little adventure, I had decided to wear this, this long sleeve task shirt, which is, again, organic cotton and bamboo. And I think task calls it their performance shirt. I don't remember the exact name, but I know the word performance is in there. So if you go searching for it, just search for task, T-A-S-C, performance, I don't know, shirt. They're, what's great about these shirts is it's crazy. You, they keep you cool, even while wearing long sleeves in the Texas heat. Now, there's a saying among those of us who do tactical training. The saying is that cotton is rotten. And that's because if you wear cotton shirts, cotton underwear, cotton socks, guess what? The cotton is going to just collect sweat. It's going to get hot and muggy and all swampy, you know, in your crotch and your armpits and in your feet, all that stuff. It's bad news all around and it's uncomfortable and it makes you hotter, by the way. So you can always tell who's kind of the newbies who are at a gun range or doing a gun course or doing anything because they're the ones that are wearing cotton. Like they got blue jeans and a cotton t-shirt, you know, it's like, dude, you're going to overheat in about 20 minutes out here, but, uh, uh, you know, good luck with that. There, there's, there are better fibers to wear. And some people like to go with all synthetic fibers, which I'm not a fan of that, you know, being a natural health oriented person, uh, the health ranger, I try to find natural fibers and I find that actual natural fibers are vastly superior to the synthetic fibers. A lot of people will just have a polyester shirt on. I don't find that comfortable, but this shirt Organic cotton, bamboo fiber with a little bit of, I think it's lycra. And some manufacturers might use a little bit of spandex, which is synthetic, but it's only 5% of the formula. This shirt kept me so comfortable, so comfortable that after training all day Saturday, I went home and washed that same shirt so I could wear it again on Sunday. And then after Sunday evening, I, I went online and I bought three or four more because I, I just decided this is the shirt I'm going to wear on the ranch. I'm going to wear this when I'm walking my goats. I'm going to wear this shirt everywhere uh, in the summer because this thing keeps you cool. It's crazy. You can have a long sleeve on where normally you think you get overheated, but it's actually, there's a cooling effect, even a slight breeze. It feels like there's a cooler on your arms because it's got the evaporative wicking effect, but it really, really works. It's not hype. And again, I'm a third party guy here. I don't have any involvement with this company. I wish I did. I would love to have a line of clothing based on this material because it's, it's just really that good. So that's my first recommendation. Uh, again, organic cotton and bamboo mix with a little bit of lycra. Oh, and these shirts, they're not super tight fitting either. Uh, they do sell fitted shirts that are more tight if you want to bulk up and show your you know, your 12 pack or whatever you have. But for the rest of us who are just normal people who are not gym monkeys, um, we don't necessarily need a super tight fitting shirt. A little bit of looseness gives a little bit more movement and flexibility, which is good. And that's the way these shirts come. They're, they're a comfortable, casual type of fit. 
but the fiber material itself is really outstanding and it keeps you cool. Even in humid climates, that's what's amazing. And of course, it protects you from the sun too, so you don't get your arms sunburned if you're out, you know, walking around all day or doing doing some of the weird stuff that that we do. Uh, my my tactical training buddies and instructors and so on and friends who who do this kind of stuff, or maybe you're into paintball or something. This would be a great shirt for for paintball. It would keep you cool and prevent you from getting sunburned. You'd you'd want to add a neck gaiter to it probably, which which I like to do because you can throw water on that neck gaiter and you can evaporate out of that, keep your neck cool, which the Chinese medicine practitioners get all uh, frustrated by that. Don't put cold water on your neck. You know, you'll have a cold invasion, wind invasion. They say, well, I don't know. I'm just overheating out here. <laughs> so I'm going I'm to use a little evaporative cooling. It's not like we're doing this under air conditioning in, indoors. So do, do what you think is best for you. Okay, that's the first gear recommendation. Second thing, I did a little experiment. I got some feedback from my uh, the Battle Belt video tour that I posted on Brighteon, which has been, for whatever reason, a super popular video. People love that video. You should watch it if you haven't seen it yet. Just go on to Brighteon.com, search for uh, Health Rangers Battle Belt. What is it? Uh, a video tour of my Battle Belt gear. And it's a really step-by-step, very well thought out, I think, just explanation of what I wear on my belt. I'm talking about a battle belt, like a, like a survival belt. If you're geared up and you're, you're responding to someone invading your ranch or breaking into your home, or you're in a survival scenario and you're moving, and you're on foot, you're going to need a battle belt like this. So it's a really great video. But in that video, I recommended the Romeo Red Dot site for the SIG P320 pistol that I carry and that I use and train with. I used to be a Glock guy until I discovered the SIG P320. Now I'm a SIG guy and I even have SIG rifles and so on, which I'll talk about later. But so in that video, I had the Romeo Red Dot on top mounted on a SIG pistol. And I was talking about how it co witnesses with the uh, suppressor height sights, the night sights that you can get on the SIG pistol. And this was this was a compact size SIG pistol. I don't I don't actually carry a full size SIG. I carry a compact SIG. It's equivalent to the Glock 19 in terms of its size, frame size, and the magazine capacity, and so on. Um, and then if I want to get real concealed, I'll just swap that out with a, a, an ultra compact SIG P320 because it uses the same magazines. I don't have to swap out magazines on my belt. So if I'm walking into a Walmart or something, what I've got with me is a SIG compact, I'm sorry, subcompact P320 with spare magazines on my belt. If it's the winter time and I can wear a jacket, then I'm going to carry the regular compact, which holds more magazines and is a little bit easier to handle. But if it's, if it's summertime and a pistol might show on your, on your hip, then I, I go to the subcompact, especially if I'm carrying in Austin or if I'm carrying in the airport. So uh, in, in Texas, it's perfectly legal to carry a loaded weapon into the non-secure areas of the airport, like baggage claim or even ticketing and check-in. You just can't go through security with a pistol, obviously, but you can walk around the rest of the airport. And I do anytime if I'm picking up somebody, uh, I've got my pistol with me, I'm loaded up, I've got extra mags, I've got a round in the chamber ready to go, but I'll, I'll carry a, a subcompact there because I don't want, I don't want to freak out any sort of barely trained airport police who, who, who might, might go crazy. You know, I don't know what their training is. I don't know how, how much trigger discipline they have. So I don't want to give them a reason to pull out their pistol and think they're going to win a congressional medal of honor or something. I'm the good guy. I'm not, I'm not the threat. I'm the good guy actually in, in all those scenarios. And sometimes you have to tell the cops, Hey, friendly, friendly show, you know, show your hands, man, start screaming friendly and you'll be fine. But I had some feedback on that video. Some people said, well, why are you running a red dot site on this SIG P320? Uh, they were challenging me on that point. There, some people really hate the red dot sites and they say it's unreliable and it requires batteries and, and, and they're correct about that. And so what I did actually as part of my training this, this last weekend, I decided to run one day a SIG P320 with a Romeo red dot site. And then the second day, I ran a SIG P320 without a Romeo 
where I had installed the True Glow TFX Pro iron sights. Now, the True Glow, that's spelled T R U G L O, all one word, by the way, a TFX Pro. Don't get anything less than that if you're going to go with iron sights. The True Glow TFX Pro sights, what's unique about them is that they combine both a light pipe, which focuses ambient light, like during the daytime, you know, sunlight, through the light pipe to light up the rear sights and the front sight for you. They combine that with tritium. So there's tritium in these, so they function very effectively at night as well, and of course, low light situations. Uh, these sights are fantastic. I had run them on my Glock for, I don't know, maybe a year or two, and I found them to be very effective. So anyway, I put some on the SIG, and I ran those side by side, well, day, day you know, back to back days, versus the Romeo Red Dot sight. And I was doing two things. I was doing timed uh, targeting, and I was checking to see accuracy and speed of shooting. And the, the conclusion, the whole point is to share this conclusion with you to save you from, you know, mistakes that I made or gear that you don't need. The conclusion of this is that by far, the iron sights made by True Glow, I outshot the Romeo sight uh, with, you know, the, the, the Sig Romeo red dot sight. And after that, I decided, I mean, it, it was such a huge difference. What I found is that the red dot slowed me down. The red dot caused me to fish around for that red dot. And it's a very narrow angle that where you have to have the pistol at, the, at this very narrow angle compared to your eyes in order to see that red dot. And that angle is so limited that it can really, really slow you down. And that's what I found, that it took me longer like half a second or a second longer to get that first shot off. And secondly, those shots were not as accurate with the red dot sight. <laughs> the spread was worse, in other words. And that really surprised me because I know that the red dot sight is very good for making slow, very accurate shots. For example, if you have all the time in the world and you need to put a, a round into a four inch target that's I don't know, 40 feet away, let's say, which is considered a pretty long distance for a, a typical concealed carry pistol engagement, then a red dot sight is probably superior if you have all the time you need because that dot is right there on target. As long as you can hold that dot still, you can put that round where you need it. And it's, you don't have quite the precision with the iron sights, not quite. But in terms of speed, which is really what counts a lot more in terms of speed, the iron sights are so much faster. I remember training with one of my Navy SEAL buddies and we were doing speed draws and shooting one day. And his goal was to get me below one second to draw and shoot and put around on target within the, what's called the A zone of a typical target. That's basically the torso of a target that's relatively close. I think that was like three yards away or something very close. But the, the, the truth is with a little practice, you can actually draw and fire and put around in the A zone of a target in less than one second. And I know this because we use the professional timing setups. I forgot what they're called. The, the, the little blue, you know, range timer things and they beep and then they time the shot using sound detection. and by the time we were practicing this drill for, you know, 20 minutes or whatever, and we kept getting faster and faster, you'd, I'd have rounds on target at, you know, 0.92 seconds or whatever it was. Uh, some of them were really close to one second. Sometimes you get 1.4 seconds when you're starting out and then you get down to 1.1 or 1.05, and then you get under a second. The thing is, these are not accurate shots. Don't, don't let anybody lie to you about that. There's no way that these shots are very uh, accurate by any means. These shots are crazy fast. If you can get them into the torso area, you're doing good. And you're not even getting a sight picture. That's just, that's almost what you would call instinctive shooting. You're not getting a sight picture at all in less than a second. To get a sight picture, you're going to have to spend more than a second. But my point is with a red dot sight, 
it took me like an extra half a second to maybe an extra full second to get the sight picture versus iron sights. So that's what I want to share with you. I'd recommended the Romeo Red Dot, but right now in terms of what most people might be facing in terms of uh, their, their concealed carry scenarios, I think you're better off with the True Glow iron sights. And so that's what I'm switching to as well. I may shoot a video to show you the difference visually on this, because I think it's, it's a very valuable lesson that I learned, and I'd like to share that with you. I talked to one of my instructors about this, by the way, and he said, yeah, you know, red dots are slower for most people. Uh, they, you give up a lot by going to a red dot, and then you, you do have the battery issue, although today's red dot sites are very reliable, and they don't fail very often. And the batteries last for years, so that's that's not that's not a big argument. It's more for me. It's more the time to the first shot, because you're you're in a situation if you need to shoot somebody, you don't want to add half a second to that. What if that guy, some bad guy, what if he can shoot, at draw and shoot in 1.2 seconds? You'd rather be at 0.95 than 1.4, right? <laughs> Does that make sense? You you need to outshoot the bad guy. Instead of fishing for a red dot, you need to just get your sight picture and, and pull the trigger. All right, so that's, that's the second thing about gear. All right, the third thing about gear is that, that after this most recent training I went through, I decided to start carrying a tourniquet on my belt at all times, everyday carry, EDC. I had not been carrying a tourniquet everywhere I go. I, I don't know why, it just didn't. I didn't think that I would need it. Now I, I realize that you do need it. And there's a really great carrier plate made by Philster. Uh, P-H-L-S-T-E-R is how that's spelled. And that's the website, philster.com. And this little plate, it's like a back plate with tiny bungee cords. And you can fold up a tourniquet, you can put it on that plate, and you can put it on your belt. And I've got one on order now, and I'm going to start putting that on my belt as soon as I get it. I'm going to start carrying that thing 24-7. And if anything, what I've learned is not only do you need to carry a tourniquet, and not only do you need to be able to deploy that tourniquet on yourself using either hand, you need to do this left-handed or right-handed, one-handed. You also need to be able to deploy it on some, somebody else. And you need to realize that you're going to run out of tourniquets real quick if you only have one. So some people go, go to town on this. They'll carry more than one tourniquet, like a, a walking EMT first aid response person, you know, but you're going to beg for that person's help. If there's a mass shooting in, you know, you're at a concert in Vegas, you're in an office building in San Bernardino, whatever, some crazy, insane psycho person or, or some radical Islamic terrorist wants to make some political statement by bombing your building or whatever, or, you know, you're at the Boston Marathon, shit happens, bad shit happens. People are bleeding. You're going to run out of tourniquets real quick. And so what we all decided is, I mean, you know, those of us who, who train together or who shoot together, things like that, we decided you got to carry one on your body at all times, typically on your belt. But you need to have more tourniquets in your vehicle bag, your first aid response bag in your vehicle. And we all decided to upsize our, our first aid bags because we realized we were carrying what we what we were carrying was too small, not enough gear for enough people. So like, yeah, oh, you've got some gauze, you've got some blood stop, you've got some triangle bandages. Yeah, that's great. You got a tourniquet or two. But that stuff runs out really quickly when bad things happen. You know, a, a shooter, some mass shooter type of person, you know, they're often shooting more than one person, right? Or a vehicle accident it wounds more than one person or a building collapse or all kinds of scenarios that you can imagine. Often when one person's getting hurt, there's like several people getting hurt at the same time, which means there's going to be bleeding that needs to get stopped across multiple people. And if you've never done this, by the way, uh, go find a class in your local area. And I think the phrase to use is just called stop the bleed. 
It's a basic class. It's kind of like a CPR class. Just go take a stop the bleed class. And they should be very dirt cheap. And if you're a teacher, by the way, there's a lot of gun instruction places all across the country that even give free courses to teachers and school administrators and school employees because, you know, the school shooting situation in all of the gun-free zones. So all these liberals, they'd like to say, oh, we're a gun-free zone which is basically a sign to the bad guys that says, come in and shoot. It's a shooting gallery in here because we don't have any way to defend ourselves. That's what a gun-free zone is. That's why almost all the shootings happen in gun-free zones. So if you are in a gun-free zone, you're going to need a whole lot of tourniquets. (laughs) That's why those of us who know about this stuff, we have pistols too, you know? Hey, the best way to stop the bleeding of innocent civilians is to shoot the bad guy before he can shoot more innocent civilians. You want, you want to stop blood loss? Take out the bad guy and then deal with whoever has been injured, but it'll be a much smaller number of injured people at that point because you have taken out the threat. So learning how to use a tourniquet, learning how to stop bleeding, it's all very important. Some people carry latex gloves with them in their everyday carry because they don't want to touch people's blood. I don't blame them. Think of all the crazy, insane diseases that people carry in their blood. This is why we don't do blood testing in our lab, by the way. I don't want to be touching everybody's blood. (laughs) Give me a break. eh? (laughs) Everybody's everybody's crazy sexually transmitted diseases and HIV and, and everything else. I don't know what they're into. You know, people who do intravenous drugs and share needles and all that stuff. Hey, yeah. Sorry, I don't want your blood all over my fingers. So some people do carry latex gloves. I haven't yet started doing that, but I I might give that some serious consideration. But, you know, the more you have, it starts to get like walking around with all this gear. I I already walk around with a lot of gear. I mean, I got a flashlight. You know, I got a multi-tool. I got a Emerson Karambit. I got a pistol. I got a spare magazine. And I got a neck knife, you know. Now I got to add... I got to add compresses and tourniquets, gloves, triangle bandages, and all this stuff. You know, you start running out of places to carry all this stuff. But I, there was one tip from a guy. I learned this tip. He carries an ankle rig. That's a, it's a, it's a covert medical kit, okay? A concealed medical kit. And I think Filster sells this, by the way, filster.com. And the medical kit consists of, you know, a tourniquet. And he's got a flashlight and he's got a, he's got a permanent marker in that thing. And he's got some gauze all folded up. And he wraps that around his ankle. Well, that would throw your ankle off if you're walking around with that and your other ankle doesn't have anything on it. So what does he do for his other ankle? Oh, a backup pistol, you know? So now he's got both ankles strapped with something, but they kind of equal out. Kind of a smart guy, if you think about it. You know, your backup ankle holster with your, I don't know, your mini your SIG P365 or whatever you have strapped on in there, just balance it out with your medical kit on your other ankle. So now you're, you're equipped. You know, not to say that ankle holsters are that incredibly useful. Most shootings are over in about three seconds and almost no shootings involve anybody ever reaching for their backup ankle pistol. That almost never happens in the history of all shootings, but I suppose it could happen. Never say never when you're dealing with emergencies. Anything could happen. So these are just some things to to think about. Uh, Again, just to review, the Task uh, organic cotton and bamboo shirts are really amazing. The True Glow TFX Pro sights are really amazing. You can get those for almost any kind of pistol, M&P pistol, a SIG, a Glock, whatever you have. And then tourniquets and and carry gear, medicine carry gear can be life-saving and it's something that I'm going to start carrying myself. But it does mean that when you get dressed in the morning, there's a lot more stuff to put on. It does take more time and it's every freaking day because that's why it's called everyday carry, EDC. If you don't carry it every day, you're you're not going to have it when you need it because Crazy stuff is going to happen to you on random days where you didn't plan for it, just by definition. So you either carry it every day or you don't have it. That's why I've carried a pistol for, 
I think going on 25 years or something like that now, every day for over 20 years. And I've never needed it, thank God. But, well, except for rattlesnakes and such. <laughs> you, this is Texas after all. So yeah, we get rattlesnakes. Although yesterday I saw kind of a small rattlesnake and it was small enough, even though it was in a strike position, I was able to use my relatively long walking stick to pick it up with the stick safely. You know, I was like, it's a long stick. It's like five feet long. Maybe it's longer. Maybe it's six feet. I don't know. It's pretty long. So I was far away and I was able to get this thing on the stick while it was rattling. Of course, it's all, you know, the rattles going off and it's pissed off and it's coiled up. And I picked it up with the stick and I, I was able to kind of fling it about 10 or 15 feet away which is fine. So I saved the rattlesnake. I did not have to shoot it because that's not my first choice, by the way. And the rattlesnake went on to go catch field mice. But with a big rattlesnake, I would not try that because the striking distance is pretty, <laughs> yeah, pretty considerable striking distance, you know, and th th that's how people get bit, by the way. And just as a side note, then I'll wrap up this whole podcast, but I don't know if you've ever talked to emergency room physicians about snake bites, but they'll tell you something that's really funny. Well, kind of, kind of funny. They say, uh, what are the requirements? Or what's the patient profile of someone who gets bit by a rattlesnake? Uh, two things. Number one, they have a lot of tattoos. And number two, they've been drinking. <laughs> and it turns out that most people in Texas that get bit by rattlesnakes are inebriated and they have a lot of tattoos. <laughs> you can draw your own conclusion about that. And they are trying to show off to buddies. They're dicking around with the rattlesnake. Like, oh, look, it's under a rock. I'm going to wave my hands in front of the rock. You know, I'm not afraid. Wham! They get bit in the hand. So most, most people bit by rattlesnakes get bit in the hand because they're dicking around with a rattlesnake. And they're not too bright. And they're not fully functional in terms of their cognitive function. So you do the math on that. Most rattlesnake bites on humans are preventable. Not all. Sometimes you're just walking along and you get struck in the, in the heel. And I admit I've had some close encounters myself where I'm walking along. Oh, my God, there's a giant rattlesnake right there. Boom. Uh, I've had that, you know, multiple times. But. The good thing is rattlesnakes are not actually super aggressive in my area. I have not seen them strike first. I've seen them coil up and do the warning thing and run the rattle. And they're not like copperheads. Copperheads are crazy psycho snakes. Copperheads will just, just start attacking like insane, just biting everything they can. Like if I put that same stick in front of a copperhead, the copperhead would absolutely try to bite my stick. You know what I mean? <laughs> they're just copperheads, are just like mean little bastard snakes. But rattlesnakes are not. Rattlesnakes would rather flee. And so if you can help them flee, and if you stop messing around with them, usually they're not going to bite you. So I was able to just kind of, you know, pick up the snake with the stick and fling it away. And I could hear its rattle. It was still angry after I threw it through the air a little bit. You know, it's fine. He landed in the grass. He's fine. And maybe he'll come back a couple months later and he's a big rattlesnake. And I might have to shoot him at that point if he doesn't move. But, you know, we'll make that decision when that happens. I've also got a bunch of miniature Nigerian dwarf goats behind me, by the way. And I don't want them to get bit by the rattlesnake. And I've got donkeys to take care of. And I don't want them to have rattlesnake bites either. So, you know, I've got, I've got other animals to think about, too which is why I will sometimes just shoot, shoot a rattlesnake, which, by the way, gives you a lot of training shooting one-handed because I don't know about you, but I don't, I don't shoot a rattlesnake without covering my ears. Now, you might say, well, wait a minute. You only have two hands. What are you shooting with if you're covering your ears? So I, I've talked about this before, but you, may, you probably haven't heard this. So there's a technique I developed to cover both ears with one hand. <laughs> and shoot with the other hand. You're like, whoa, dude, what, what kind of weird joint system do you have? Are you double jointed? How does that work? No. 
you can do it too. So you, if you're a right-handed shooter, okay, you shrug your left shoulder. You put your left shoulder on your left ear. You reach over your head with your left hand and you shove one of the fingers of your left hand into your right ear. Got it? So you are now a set of ear protection earmuffs. <laughs> and now it's good to have skin. You need to have your left shoulder exposed. So roll up, roll up your shirt. Get your left shoulder skin on your left ear. Otherwise, it won't be a good seal. And you'll have a lot of gunshot sound coming through the clothing. You see what I mean? So let me start over step by step. Here's what you do. Roll up your left sleeve. Shrug your left shoulder. Stick your left shoulder skin over your left ear. Seal it. Good. Reach over your head. Put your left index finger into your right ear. If you have long fingernails, you might want to cut them before you go out where there's rattlesnakes. So now you got a, both ears plugged. Now you draw your pistol with your right hand. You sight in on the head of that snake. Don't forget your pistol sight offset. Remember, you got to aim like half an inch over or an inch over, depending on where your sights are. And pull the trigger. Boom, rattlesnake head disappears. You can now holster your weapon and you can release your ear protection. That's how you do it. And I know this because I do this very frequently. And <laughs> it's, it absolutely works. And you have no hearing damage as a result. So <laughs> you, you look like probably a, some kind of crazy fool out there. What are you doing reaching over your head? What are you doing? Well, I don't walk around with ear pro all the time. I don't know about you, but I, when I'm, I'm out walking my dogs or walking my goats, I don't have... I don't have like a battle helmet on and all kinds of ear protection. I, I don't carry that stuff all the time. So you just use your, use your skin and use your fingers. That's how it's done. In any case, I hope this has been an, maybe an interesting, slightly entertaining, but practical and useful podcast. You can, of course, find more podcast material at healthrangerreport.com or better yet, just go to brighton.com or naturalnews.com, the entire right column is set up there for a podcast. And you'll catch most of my podcasts there. Most of them are 15 minutes or, or shorter in duration, but some of them are longer like this one, just because I just happen to have more time to talk about things. But I appreciate your support. And also, if you want to continue to support our overall mission, then you can go to healthrangerstore.com and you can purchase health ranger products there laboratory validated supplements superfoods green home organic products non-gmo products lab tested to be safe and pure and clean so check those out at healthrangerstore.com and take my advice that i mentioned in this podcast get the gear you need get the training you need and be ready for anything because there's a lot that's coming Thanks for listening. Learn more at healthrangerreport.com. Thank you for watching. If you want to support our mission, visit us at healthrangerstore.com for the world's largest selection of lab verified superfood and nutritional products for healthy living. It's at healthrangerstore.com. <laughs>